Well, we're in Acts chapter 20, and we resume our study in verse 28. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading in verse 25, where Paul tells these Christians, And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Therefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shrunk from declaring unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Paul tells these church leaders that God will hold them accountable for the people that they serve. A Bible teacher must be very careful to give the people that he speaks to the complete counsel of God found in the Bible and not to hold anything back. It's better for a Bible teacher to have an empty church or a church filled with people who are uncomfortable because they've heard the Word of God than to have God angry at them. I should say God angry at him because he failed to give them the truth. 29. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Satan is a roaring lion, and he has vicious wolves in the form of false teachers at his disposal. <clears throat> and their sole purpose is to destroy the souls of people. They do not spare the flock. The only thing that can combat the enemy, people like that, inspired by the devil and his demons, the only thing that can combat them is the pure word of God. Verse 30. Also from among your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. <clears throat> and, you know, the only way God's people can recognize perverse things or spiritual distortions is if they have a good understanding of truth. When Christians are not taught the Bible, they are wide open to deception. 31. Therefore, watch and remember that for the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul wasn't just a truth dispenser. He taught the word of God because he cared about people. 32. <clears throat> and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of God is such a wonderful thing builds up our faith, it works in us, it works through us, and it helps us to attain a spiritual inheritance that we're going to be able to enjoy forever. It's just so sufficient, and that's why I love it so much. 33. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Paul was not a money-hungry preacher. Ministry was not a career to him. It was a calling from God. And anyone who looks at ministry as a career instead of a calling should quit and do something else because chances are they're going to compromise the Word of God in order to have a successful career, so-called. 34. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my own necessities and also to those who were with me. As a Bible teacher... Paul had the biblical right 
to be supported by those that he taught. The Bible is very clear on this. Those who are taught the word of God should share all good things, should share material things with their teacher. But if people didn't support him, and consequently he had to work a secular job, then that's what he did. He'd rather work two jobs than appear to be in the ministry for the money. He didn't want anyone to think that he was using Jesus to build a financial portfolio for himself. 35. I have shown you all things, how that by so laboring, ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Some believers lack spiritual joy because they have too much of a self-focus. They're always thinking about receiving and never thinking about giving. They're unhappy because they focus on themselves and trying to attain their happiness. That's a recipe for failure every time. True spiritual joy is a, pro a byproduct of working to make Jesus happy. 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. Whenever, whenever possible, kneeling is the best position in prayer. It just reminds us that God is God. 37. And they all wept sorely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all because of the words which he had spoken, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him into the ship. And just step back for a second. I'm going to try to refresh your memory a little bit because this is really an amazing scene. You have Paul, a former arrogant Pharisee, a former strict Jew who persecuted the church and despised the heathen. What is he doing? He is weeping with a bunch of former heathens. Why? Because they won't see each other anymore? You see, what a testimony this is to the power of Christ to transform a person's life and attitude. No one but Jesus can change people in such a dramatic way from the inside out. Let's go into chapter 21. And it came to pass, after we had parted from them and had set sail, we came on a straight course to Coas, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Paul was sailing for the coast of Israel. Today, the place he would be heading to would be the coast of Lebanon. 3. Now when we had sighted Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to discharge her burden. And verse 4, And having found the disciples, we tarried there seven days. And they told Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to, to, to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit told these disciples what the Apostle Paul was in for in Jerusalem. Once he got there, and, and it would not be good. And consequently, they tell Paul not to go. They don't want him to walk into big trouble. And notice that God didn't really tell Paul not to go. These Christians are telling him not to go. Five. And when his days there had been accomplished, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children until we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we boarded ship and they returned home again. And once again, they kneel and pray. And, and as I suggested a few minutes ago, kneeling shows reverence. It's, it's true that God is our Father, but He is still God. And, and kneeling is a reminder of that fact. <clears throat> Verse 7. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais and saluted the brethren 
and stayed with them one day. The next day, we who were in Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and lodged with him. And do you remember Philip? He was one of the first seven deacons. He was the first person to take the gospel to the Samaritans, and he's also the one who preached Christ and baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. Verse 9. It says, And this man had four daughters, virgins, who prophesied. Now, in the church... Women are called to do certain things, and so are men. One thing women are not to do is to usurp the authority of men within a church. They are not to lead men in the church. That's very clear in scriptural, Scripture, but clearly something else is true. God did not intend for women to sit on the sidelines and never engage in any form of ministry. They're just not to lead men. And that would prohibit them from becoming pastors. 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he had come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. This is at least the third time that the Holy Spirit has warned Paul about trouble that awaits him in Jerusalem. But Paul will not be deterred. He will push on regardless of the consequences. God's will is more important than our comfort Doing what is right is more important than having what we want. And living for eternity is more important than living for today. Twelve. And when we heard these things, both we and those in that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am not only ready to be bound but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be dissuaded, he ceased, or we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. When he would not be dissuaded, no one was going to talk Paul out of going to Jerusalem. No one was able to deter Paul from doing what God wanted him to do. No matter how hard they tried. And notice that Jesus did not have a gun stuck in Paul's back either. He wasn't forcing them to go to Jerusalem. Paul was going because he was the Lord's servant. And he knew it was the right thing to do in the eyes of God. So you see, once again I say, self was irrelevant to the Apostle Paul. And that's why he was able to be so successful in ministry. Self was irrelevant to Paul Christ meant everything. And if you think that's radical, then you have become too worldly in your thinking because it is not radical. It is normal. At least it should be normal. <clears throat>